Start when you're ready. Oh, okay. Good morning. Good morning. I'd like to welcome everyone to this uh, Ways and Means Committee meeting. So as we move forward, let's call this Start meeting to order and please call the roll. Oh, okay. Alderman Davis. Present. Where are the other all the people? They need to be unmuted. All the all the people. Alderman Vaccaro. Present. Alderman Howard. Present. Alderman Tamika Hubbard. Alderman Murphy. Present. Alderman Spencer. Alderman Muhammad. Here. Alderman Odenberg. Present. Alderman Boyd. Alderman Shamine Hubbard. Here. Chairman Vollmer. Alderman Tamika Hubbard. Alderman Spencer. You have eight present. You have a quorum present. Thank you. We'll wait to the end of the meeting to acknowledge excused alderman if necessary. Again, uh, welcoming all of our guests for today. I'd like to make sure that you know that you are special and that we appreciate the opportunity to have your input uh, on our budget process and your concerns as the public. I can um, definitely make sure that this process is as professional as possible and that we will be as respectful of each other. So I'm really looking forward to this. Uh, the first thing I'd like to do is to make sure that uh, we have a couple of people who say that they cannot hear us. Uh, so I'm not sure what the problem is, but I'm letting the technician know that. Uh, also, we uh, need to move forward in uh, acknowledging our special guest for today is Paul Payne. He is our budget director for the city of St. Louis. He will not be taking questions from the public or from the committee members. He is here to observe, to take notes so that he can appropriately understand where we need to have additional concerns with our budget. And that again is another reason why we need to be cognizant of our time because I want the public to have all of the time today. Uh, I also would like to have um, our, uh, a brief review of the board bill one for today. So uh, I'm not sure if one of our clerks is available to read that for us so the public is aware again of exactly what we're looking at. Read which now? Uh, just reading the board bill one, just the introduction of it. Mm -hmm. I think it's listed on our agenda for the committee. Okay. Board bill number one introduced by President Reed and Alderman Joseph Vollmer. City's annual budget appropriation for fiscal year beginning July 1st, 2020 and ending June 30th 2021, amounting in the aggregate to the sum of $1,116,375,497, which sum is hereby appropriated for revenue and special funds named for the purpose hereinafter enumerated and containing an emergency clause. All right, thank you, sir. Uh, the next item on our agenda is the uh, review of our rules, and I'd like to ask our clerk to uh, make sure that uh, he takes us through that process. Okay, then. The procedure for today, speakers will be called in the order that uh, they registered, which list has been provided to the members of the committee and the vice chair who is chairing the, the meeting. Each speaker will be given three minutes of time to speak. Each speaker will be called on by name when it's their time to speak by the chair. Each speaker may speak on the topic of the city budget and any related issues uh, to it. 
Uh, each speaker will be given uh, the one, I believe the chair said a 30 minute mark when they seconds. have reached that point so that you know you're getting to the end of your three minutes. Each speaker will also be told when their time is up. Once their time is up, a speaker is just to stop talking unless the chair gives them additional time. Um, any participant may leave written comments by sending them to the email address that you registered or by calling the Board of Aldermen at 589-6845 to make arrangements to leave any written comments. Uh, there have been several written comments that were sent in and the committee will acknowledge those later in the meeting. Uh, those are pretty much the rules for today, um, Madam Vice Chair. Thank you very much. As uh, we move forward, uh, I'd like to share something with you as I'm reading all these chats. So we have some Zoom bombing going on. We have some hate uh, messages in our chat. I'd like to ask my technician to handle some of that for us and uh, because we would like to have a, a very, very concise public hearing that allows people to be recognized and get additional input for a tough job that has to be done by the Board of Aldermen and this Ways and Means Committee. So I thank you if you can handle some of that for us. And I respectfully say to you, for those of you who are taking your personal time to be a part of this exercise, I am sorry and I apologize for those who unfortunately cannot respect you and this process. Uh, the next item on our agenda is to uh, move forward with our public testimony. And I'd like to uh, start at the beginning of our list and make sure that uh, we are moving forward expeditiously as uh, our clerk indicated, you will get a 30 second uh, notice uh, towards the end of your three minutes. And of course, uh, as I did notice, there are a number of people from the same organization that would like to speak. If at some point you feel as though uh, you don't have enough time or whatever, or you all would like to choose just one or two people to speak, just let us send us a message and let us know that. And or one of the speakers could indicate that as they are speaking. Uh, but that is up to you. Uh, we cannot make those decisions for you. So uh, let's move forward with our first speaker. And uh, that is Dennis Bogovic. And you have a topic of Ward Capital. Dennis, are you there? Doesn't look like he's connected. Okay, you don't see his connection? That's correct. Okay. Uh, if he gets on later on and we still have time, we'll come back. Our second speaker listed here is John Chasnoff, and your topic is Cure Violence and Police Budget. Uh, yes. Um, can you all hear me? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you so much for having this uh, forum today, and I very much appreciate the chance to speak with you. Um, I wanted to lay out some context for where I think we're at as a community and then some budget solutions that I think are important. So I want to start by acknowledging that we're still in the time of a virus and that African, African Americans are on the front line of our essential services and are being asked to put their lives at risk for all of us. At the same time, those African Americans have less health care as a whole, and they're more likely to be fired if they get sick. Um, the disparities in COVID outcomes are so great that governments around the country are beginning to pass resolutions declaring that racism is a public health issue. Um, and we've all watched over the last few days as yet another African American has been murdered by police who had no regard for basic human dignity and um, much less any recognition of the divine in each of us. We're also living in a time when violent crime in our city is remaining unacceptably high. 
and we're at the start of a serious recession, which is also affecting city revenues, but which is besides affecting revenues, it's also affecting those citizens who are at the low end of our economic survival, disproportionately African-Americans. So I wanted to speak to you all today about how do these realities come together and how do we devise a budget response? So I would say that now is the time more than ever to shift our priorities and no longer exempt some departments from scrutiny. Emergency COVID funds are great, but we need to think long-term. So first, I think we need to commit ourselves to cure violence. Uh, this is a program that's dedicated to looking at violence as a public health issue and moving away from the failed public safety model that's based on arrest and incarceration. Um, second year and third year funding for um, um, cure violence have, have been discussed as a possible cut, and we need to take that um, issue off the table and make sure cure violence is fully funded. Um, Secondly, I think we need to close the workhouse. Alderman Vaccaro has asked every department head what they can live without, and we can live without spending eight to nine million dollars more on housing only 128 detainees. The math does not add up. And why was it that no one asked Director Edwards why he was so sure that detainee numbers would go up? You're at 30 seconds. Okay, the police budget, it can no longer be sacrosanct. We have to look at why we have too many white shirts. We have to look at why we are funding 130 officers that we cannot hire. We have to look at a cadet program that has only 12 people in the pipeline after spending $750,000. We have to look at the RTCC, which is mainly effective at stopping car thefts, but does not help with violent crime. Um, so um, we need a transparent budget where we can really look at the line items of the police budget so that we can determine what cuts are necessary. So just to conclude, I want to say that we live in a time when it's long past time to reimagine public safety, pull money from failed programs, and build our community in these difficult times. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, too. Uh, our next speaker is Serena Muhammad. So my name is Serena Mohammed. I'm the Director of Strategic Initiatives for the St. Louis Mental Health Board, and I provide staff support to the Cure Violence Steering Committee. Uh, the Steering Committee is a community-led team of 10 voting members uh, who supports the Health Department in implementing Cure Violence. We formed and held our first meeting in March and have met six times over the past three months. This is a very active and committed group of neighborhood residents, youth leaders, clergy, public health workers, foundation staff, and mental health providers. Uh, these individuals have come together with the express intent to help cure violence succeed so that we can save lives in our community. It is important to note that in the three short months that this group of residents and community leaders has been activated, they have helped support the launch of the Cure Violence site in Wellsville, Fellow Hamilton Heights, including assisting with the recruitment and hiring of six violence interrupters and outreach workers. They have also helped develop community engagement and education strategies. I emphasize the hard work and commitment of these group of volunteers to demonstrate the fact that the community is doing its part. The city of St. Louis committed to fund cure violence for three years so that we could implement a proven public health strategy to violence prevention. It is the only city funded violence interruption strategy that is not focused on law enforcement. Cure violence is the perfect model to foster community engagement so that the neighborhoods that are most impacted by violence play a role in interrupting the cycles of violence that plague our community. To date, under the leadership of Employment Connection led by Sal Martinez, the first cure violence site has been established in a neighborhood location in Hamilton Heights. They have been doing canvassing. They're distributing information in the community about COVID-19. They've hosted a virtual meeting to offer resources and support to the neighborhood residents. The work is happening. The community is committed. And we ask that the city of St. Louis upholds its commitment to protect cure violence funding so that the program is not cut short before it has the chance to save lives. We ask that you continue to prioritize the lives of our children. We have to support community-driven programs that work. We want our youth and families to feel safe. We want St. Louis to thrive. We need to do everything we can to invest in solutions that can make all of that possible. So the Cure Violence Steering Committee requests that you maintain the full three years of funding for cure violence. 
I thank you so much for your input. And I wanted to also uh, make sure that those of you who have written comments, please forward them to the committee so that we can make them part of the record. Thank you. So just quickly, John Muhammad texted Did me. Did you know that he's, my GM reward He's saying that he cannot, he's locked out. He was having trouble signing in. If the technician could, is taking care of that. Okay. Okay. He just texted me asking to let you know. Thank you. Our next speaker is uh, Daniel Pate. Your topic is city revenues. Mr. Pate was said he was unable to make it. Oh, that's true. I, I, mm -hmm. I have a note right here saying that to me. Let's move forward. Our next uh, speaker is, uh, is it Gerard Connolly or Gerald? Your topic is city revenues. Mr. Connolly, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, we can now. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, yes, I'd like to address um, some of the city revenues that um, we could avail ourselves of if we did reform our tax incentive policies. Uh, the city's comprehensive annual re financial report shows that, you know, last year um, combined with tip and tax abatements, that's over $30 million. That could be revenue coming into schools, uh, the general revenue and other city services. Um, I'm very concerned that the Board of Aldermen does not have purview over some of the incentives, including the sales tax exemption on construction materials, which has been granted very frequently in the last couple of years. And that just goes to the LCRA board for approval. I'm afraid I've got a contract working, so I apologize for the background noise. Um, okay, I think I'll, I'll finish off there. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir, for your comments. Our next speaker is Tony Taylor, and your topic is uh, funding cure violence. Go right ahead, please. Um, it looks like that person is not connected also. Okay, Tony is not connected. We can always come back if they show up later on. Make sure I put that there. All right, um, we'll move on to our next speaker. Lisa Grong, your topic is cure violence. Yes, thank you. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Lisa LeGron and I am part of the Cure Violence Steering Committee. Cure violence is needed more than ever. I'm out there, I'm out there with the people. The murder rate and the shootings are at an all-time high. It needs to be some intensive de-escalation de going on right now. A lot of these shootings are retaliating shootings. And women or children, innocent, or, or being shot down at a normal rate. Cure violence can help curb some of this violence, and at the same time, it can heal and rebuild our community. I did this program, I was a supervisor in this program, in a different program similar to this 20 years ago, and it worked. So I'm just real passionate about it. So from the Cure Violence Committee, I'm just asking that you don't take away the funding for this program. Thank you. Thank you so much. Our next speaker is Susie Chasnoff and your topic is cure violence and uh, real public safety. Hi, I just wanted to say, uh, am I unmuted? Okay. Yes, no ma'am, we can hear you. Thank you. I just wanted to say that I thoroughly support your violence and I hope the funding is not cut. I think we're embarking upon a new normal now and that that needs to be part of the new normal. COVID has been a horrible thing, but it's given us an opportunity to really assess what's going on in our community. And in terms of real public safety, we have got to stop funding failed models. The failed model of arrest incarcerate has not solved our 
silence problem. In fact, it's probably contributed to it. Um, why is the police budget sacro state? Why can't we take money out of that department and put it into the thing that will really solve the issue of real public safety? Jobs, health care, affordable housing, functional rec centers, and the list goes on and we all know what they are. We have to reimagine our public safety and we need to shift the old model. It isn't working. So my question to you is, how will you, as individuals on the Ways and Means Committee, think about how to change, to affect this change into real public safety? What do you have to do? When I listen to the Ways and Means Committee meetings, I know all you know about real public safety in some time. But when I hear you all speaking, I don't hear that being incorporated into your discussion incorporated into how you're doing the budget. It doesn't seem to have shifted you from our old normal to what needs to be our new normal. So my question to you is how can you shift your thinking as individuals and shift your thinking as a committee? And God bless all of you. Thank you for all the hard work you do. And Marlene especially, many thanks to you for listening to us when we spoke and for being an advocate for change. Thank you so much, Susie, for those comments. And I do appreciate your passion and your continued involvement. Uh, I want to double check with our technician. Do we have Alderman Muhammad, Muhammad online? No, I don't see him yet. He should be able to connect. He should be okay. able to connect now. Thank you very much. Our next speaker, and I hope I don't uh, butcher your name too much, is Nadia Krishnan. Please feel free to cor correct me. Looks like she hasn't connected either. Okay. We'll move on to the next speaker. Uh, Alicia Hernandez, your topic is budget priorities. Uh, good morning and thank you um, committee members for holding this hearing. My name is Alicia Hernandez. I am a resident of the 10th Ward and I am speaking on behalf of the American Civil Liberties Union of Missouri. Uh, and I would like to express our strong support for defunding the workhouse in the 2021 city budget. Um, it's time for the workhouse to close. Uh, St. Louis City spends 16 million annually to fund the St. Louis Medium Security Institution. Um, we also know this is the workhouse. Uh, this is money that could be invested in our communities for affordable housing, job training, and education. The ACLU Campaign for Smart Justice is working in all 50 states for reforms to usher in a new era of justice, um, which includes bail reform. We're fighting to overhaul harmful, unjust, and for-profit systems that needlessly lock up people who haven't been convicted of a crime uh, just because they can't afford to pay bail. In fact, 90% of people in the workhouse um, have been held pretrial, often because they are too poor to afford bail, and the system is too flooded to provide them with adequate representation. Action St. Louis, Bell Project, and Art City Defenders have led this fight, and for many years, organizations, including the ACLU of Missouri, have brought to light the abuses of the workhouse. Uh, this institution has been a persistent problem. Even in 2009, the ACLU of Missouri released a report uh, on the critical conditions of the workhouse, citing assaults and cover-ups, um, and in August 2012, again, the ACLU of Missouri called for an independent committee to provide oversight at the jail. So, uh, committee members, today I ask you to defund and close the workhouse and move us toward a system that is more equitable and effective. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comments. Uh, just to remind you again, if you have written comments, feel free to uh, send them in to us, please. Our next speaker is Lawanda Lachey Felder, and your topic is treatment of inmates.
Lawanda Felder. They're not listed. Hello? Are they in? I, oh, I thought I heard. I thought I heard her. Madam Chair, I think, yes. I think you skipped number ten, Alicia Hernandez. She just spoke. Oh, I thought that was the other lady from. Okay, never mind. Alicia just spoke. Okay, I thought that was the other lady. Okay, thank you. Uh huh. I'm gonna keep straight. Oh, yeah. I'll ask our technician. Do you see where Lawanda signed in? Does not look like it. I just got a comment from uh, another person that some people did not receive their links. So I'm going to go in and resend um, all the emails. So anyone who's already on, don't worry that. Okay. And I'm checking and we're coming back to people that were not on. So we'll go back and pick them up. Oh, good. Okay. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker listed here is uh, Amelia. Hinkley, and your topic is raises for city workers. Hi, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So um, my name is Amelia. I live in the 15th ward, Alderwoman Greens ward. Um, and so as you said, I wanted to address the city workers raise issue. Um, back in February, for those who don't know, the board and the mayor passed a bill that would give city workers a 3% merit raise for the first time in many years. Um, but in this new budget, um, that is taken away and potentially, from what I understand, even the normal 1.5% cost of living inc increase is potentially on the board to be removed in a worst case scenario. Um, and so, you know, if you are looking around right now, you know that this is exactly the time that these people deserve merit raises. They are on the front lines. They are keeping the city running, sometimes at great personal risk. Um, and so they absolutely deserve this now more than ever. Um, and I understand that tough decisions need to be need to be made and that the raise issue um, is a difficult one and, and the city is saving between six and $10 million from the city budget by cutting uh, the city worker ra raises. Um, but when I look at the budget, I see that we have a lot of money and the way that we're allocating it highlights the priorities of our government. And so for example, $7.6 million is still being apportioned for the workhouse. And so if we were to close this terrible prison, that's $7.6 million that could be going towards our city workers. Um, and so we're showing our priorities right now and where we're spending our money. And what I see is that we are prioritizing incarcerating our citizens over empowering our citizens. And we are prioritizing punishment over reward. And we are, we are prioritizing a system, as many people have pointed out, that doesn't work. Um, and so I understand that tough decisions need to be made, but this doesn't seem like a tough decision at all. This seems like a very easy one, which is we should be investing in our citizens. We should be investing in St. Louis and not investing in a citizen that is, they're investing in a system that is traumatizing uh, folks, primarily black folks in this city and has been terrorizing them for decades. So I wholeheartedly um, support defunding the workhouse, paying our city workers what they are owed, um, and moving forward with a city that is focused on the future, that is focused on a brighter St. Louis, as opposed to one that is constantly focused on incarcerating, terrorizing, traumatizing our black community and our poor community. So I hope that the board will focus on a more humane budget um, and that they will focus on defunding the workhouse and paying our city workers what they're owed. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your comments. Uh, our next speaker is Reverend Dr. Cassandra Gold, and your topic is budget priorities. Yes, uh, thank you so much uh, for the opportunity uh, to share with you all today. Um, again, I'm Reverend Gould. I am executive director of Missouri Faith Voices. We are a statewide grassroots org and made up of uh, multi-faith, multi-racial uh, congregations. A budget for us is a moral document. We believe that um, the decrease um, of the budget appropriated to the workhouse is a move in the right direction. But as people of faith, we believe that priorities should be people. And as the previous speaker said, empowering people and decarceration. Public safety um, as a concept is really dog whistle for over policing and serves to support the carceral state that we currently live in. Not only are we in a global pandemic with COVID-19, but people, especially people north of Del Mar, as you all well know, uh, 
are in a petrol pandemic of poverty and it impacts black people more than it impacts other St. Louisans. We continue to live under the, uh, the divide, uh, Del Mar divide and the workhouse is a part of that. The fact that there are only 109 people there and thanks be to God, I had uh, the unfortunate uh, opportunity to visit the workhouse um, with a group of clergy last fall and prove to me just what I heard from people who had been incarcerated there, that it is not a safe place for people. We believe that it is an unnecessary institution and that is $8 million that can go to some other programs in the city such as Cure Violence. Um, last weekend, 19 people were St. Louis. We have violence interrupters that are out on the street, people who have been out giving masks and et cetera. And one of the things we always encounter is hopelessness. People in St. Louis, uh, even the, the shooting and the violence is a result of hopelessness. And so there are programs that we can continue to invest in, again, such as cure violence and other programs that demonstrate compassion um, and moral choices. And so I know your job is hard and I'm praying for each of you um, that you do what is right for all of St. Louis and that we can finally uh, have a city that looks as good on one side of Del Mar, that people are able to thrive on both sides of Del Mar. Thank you. Thank you so very much for your comments. Uh, and please do continue to pray for all of us because that's one thing that can truly make a difference. Uh, I'd like to ask our uh, board clerk, if you could put a message out for the opportunity for people to email their comments to us so that we can have those. I'd I, appreciate I just, that. I just sent it. Thank you so very much. Okay. All right, our next uh, speaker is uh, Toby Izamatavia, and your topic is ways to better support community. Yes, thank you. And thank you for this opportunity to speak today. Um, I have been living in St. Louis, uh, just a couple of blocks from City Hall for over a year now. But I've heard about the horrors of the workhouse long before I moved to St. Louis. And I think it's time for the city to rethink how the workhouse and even the cash bail system work together to stigmatize and traumatize uh, people in our community simply for being poor. True public safety requires funding programs that support the people in our communities um, in ways that, that simply incarcerating them cannot possibly do. True public funding requires funding of schools and enabling schools to have programs that help and support not only the children, but their families as well. True public safety requires funding mental health services and diversion programs for substance abuse. True public funding requires uh, funding housing, uh, safe and affordable housing for all of our citizens in this community. So I think that this, I urge you to really rethink spending money on an institution that has been shown to simply traumatize people for being poor and to take that money and divert it into programs that truly address the needs of the community and will help make our community stronger for everybody who lives here. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comments. Uh, I'd like to make sure that uh, as we move forward, I'm gonna continue to remind us that uh, we definitely want any written comments sent in to us. Uh, I do know that I've taken note that a, one person that I have passed their name has got online. I'll be coming back to you momentarily. I'd like to continue with a couple of others here. Uh, Alec Jessar, your topic is sanitation, hygiene, uh, products for people incarcerated. Hello, can you all hear me? Yes, sir. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, so I am here uh, today um, to say that I think that 
right now, uh, more than ever, it is extremely important that we take the courageous step to close the workhouse. I think that it is shameful that it remains open and that it remains open, especially during COVID, which is a pandemic that happens once in a century. It's astounding to me that at this time of all, it remains open. Um, but I and many others think it should have been closed the day that it was opened initially. The thing is though, you know, it's possible for the city to take action and to close it every single day that goes by. It's really not that hard. If the people who have the power to close it just say, it's time to close it, then this will be over and we can move on to refunding, uh, pushing funds into the things that actually cure violence and that make our communities safer. Uh, so this is something, this is an absolutely actionable step that I think that we can all take together um, and that will bring us together. And the second thing I wanna say is that um, I think it's important to acknowledge that there's a direct link between the police violence that we're seeing across the country and the workhouse. And that is that they are both uh, the product of a system that views black lives as disposable. I think in St. Louis, we can do better than that. We can view uh, everybody as fully human um, and we can have compassion for the people in the workhouse and the people who are often exposed to police violence. Our budget reflects those values. And so I ask the Ways and Means Committee uh, to please take some action in light of the pandemic, in light of these things that we're seeing across the country. If these things don't move you know, the people in power, I don't know what will. And I think it's time that, that we can have a better future together. Thank you. I think I lost audio from Alderman Ben Davis. As it seems your microphone has malfunctioned, Alderwoman Davis. You may need to disconnect and come back. I do. I oh, disconnect. I'm back. Okay. Uh, we do. We're going to probably have a lot of technical problems, but as a whole, I think we're doing well and we're moving forward. Um, our next speaker is Grace Cunningham, and your topic is police funding. Please move forward. Grace Cunningham is unable to speak. Uh, she reached out earlier. She's unable to make it today. Okay, thank you very much. We'll move on to the next speaker, Jocelyn Garner. And your topic is treatments of inmates living conditions in city jail. Yes. Okay, so the treatment is very inhumane. Before making the trip to the workhouse, you're sprayed with bug spray, which looks just like an exterminator we use to kill the pest in your homes. This begins the dehumanization. Then when you get there, you're verbally and ultimately mentally abused by the COs who see you as nothing more than animals, which isn't really effective to rehabilitate anyone. If anything, it causes more anger and stress. Now imagine being treated like this for months and sometimes years, then being released back into society. How do you think this plays out? While we're on the topic, of uh, mental health. The CEOs are not qualified or trained to deal with women with mental health issues. While they allow these women to be bullied by other inmates, when they try to defend themselves, they're maced, handcuffed, thrown in showers, and locked in their cells for up to 10 days, coming out only an hour a day for nothing more than defending themselves, where the CEOs fail. Women get sick in those cells from the mold, causing them to pass out and have seizures, nosebleeds, et cetera. Calling for help is useless because the COs don't care. They ignore the pleas and continue on like nothing, hence the deaths. We're forced to drink water from a faucet that's encrusted with lime, rust, and yes, mold. I've been there when they do these supposed walkthroughs, and not once have they entered a cell or talked to any inmates about living conditions. Let's talk about the food. The food they feed you, wouldn't you wouldn't give this to a dog. 
And you know they go with the lowest bidder, meaning the food that they give you is a super pork quality, meaning mystery meats, clay dough noodles, moldy bread, spoiled vegetables, and juice that's given to you out of a cooler filled with mold in the spout. Not everyone has money or can make commissary, so they have no choice but to eat that food, which causes stomach pain, bloating, constipation, et cetera, which is painful and can be severe due to lack of medical attention. Defunding. Money, in my opinion, the money should be taken from the workhouse and used in other areas. Money could be spent on health care, mental health, adult education, just programs geared toward helping people get a job, get housing, get, get a new trade, something like that. Money shouldn't be spent to keep oppressing and abusing people. You tried that. It doesn't work. Now it's time to take a more humanistic approach. Time to give some hope. And that's what I got. And that's all I have for that. Thank you very much for your comments. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to uh, skip over because we have someone who has to leave. Uh, Zoe Jennings, are you still there? Yes, I am here. Thank you. Uh, all right. Your topic is defending workhouse. Yes. Um, hello, my name is Zoe and I'm a resident of the 8th Ward. I've lived in the city for six years um, and I appreciate the opportunity to speak. I'll be speaking on defunding the workhouse. Um, I think other folks have um, hit on a lot of the big points that right now the workhouse or as of April 2020 is only host, um, housing around 100 folks and yet $8 million is still being allotted for that. Um, and I think as so many people know, um, so many people in this region have lost their lives and livelihoods due to the pandemic. And if we need at any point to shift resources, it's right now to keep people healthy and out of poverty. Um, I think as other people, especially Jocelyn have touched on, it is not safe to keep people housed in the workhouse or really any form of prison or jail right now. The workhouse in particular has a history of unsafe and unsanitary conditions. There's no way for folks to social distance or keep from spreading the virus. Um, in the US, more than 20,000 incarcerated people have tested positive for coronavirus. In one facility in Ohio, more than 80% of those held tested positive. It's pretty scary numbers. And to address this, a number of states and municipalities have taken actions to release incarcerated people. Um, in order to slow the spread. Uh, these include Wisconsin, Ohio, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania. And these are prisoners who have been convicted. Excuse me, these are people that have been convicted. In the case of the workhouse, we're talking primarily about people who can't afford cash bail and are awaiting trial. So I see no reason why these people can't be released and the workhouse defunded. Thank you for this opportunity. Um, and you all have a good one. Thank you very much for your comments. Uh, our next speaker is Reverend Dr. Dietra Wise Baker. Your topic is budget priorities. Uh, not, I think she's in the attendee section and she's gonna e email her report in. She could not get in the panelist section. Okay. Thank you for that. Uh, we'll move on to our next speaker. And that is Aurora Schmidt. And the topic is allocating more to uh, community needs. Mm -hmm. um, hi, good morning. Uh, my name is Aurora Schmidt and I'm a resident of the Dutchtown neighborhood in South City. And I've been in St. Louis since the first grade. <clears throat> I've worked as a case manager for houseless youth at Covenant House and Youth in Need. And I owned a small alteration shop on Cherokee Street from 2018 until this April. As a former youth worker and business owner in the city of St. Louis, I'm here today to implore you to defund the workhouse and reallocate those funds to the great needs in our community. Um, the most recent indicator of how badly we're lacking in resources is the need for St. Louis's grassroots network of mutual aid, which I feel really lucky to be a part of, but it's a lot of work. Um, the St. Louis Mutual Aid Network has already raised and redistributed $180,000 as well as collectively thousands of hours of organizing and countless grocery and supply donations and delivery. And this is money and volunteer labor that is coming from people who already pay taxes. So we're, we're showing you what we care about. 
Um, in a majority of St. Louis, no one is talking about how much we need to incarcerate people right now. And honestly, even before COVID, most of us weren't delusioned into thinking the workhouse solved any problems or provided any justice. Doing mutual aid and talking to many of my neighbors has given me a lot of clarity about what people are thinking about right now. And we're worried about making it through this pandemic. This includes getting food on the table. I live on Merrimack by Ted Drews. And every Friday during quarantine, Confluence Academy, the school down the street, distributes food. And yesterday when I went out to my car for work, the line of cars was all the way to my block, which is six blocks down from this school. And I'm just kind of flabbergasted that we're talking about spending $8 million a year to cage 110 people when there's food insecurity. Um, like, I feel like we should be ashamed of that. People are talking about schools. Um, you know, education is supposed to be equal, but only kids in housing with consistent internet access actually had any chance of really finishing out the school year. How is that fair? <clears throat> Imagine what educational resources we could provide for our kids with $8 million a year. The list goes on of things my community needs to thrive. Mental health resources, the Cure Violence Program, affordable housing, small business support. How is it fair to spend millions of dollars to cage human beings while simultaneously denying the basic rights of food, shelter, healthcare, and education to our children and community? Please ask yourself this question as you represent your constituents while budget planning for 2021. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much for your comments. Uh, our next speaker is Tracy Spies. Your topic is Cure Violence and Workhouse. Thank you uh, for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Tracy Fantini Spies and I'm a social worker um, and a, a resident of the 11th Ward. Um, I have two kids in, in St. Louis Public Schools. And I'd just like to say that we've all heard the quote that you know, budgets are moral documents and you know what a community values by how, how it spends its money. Um, and we're spending 60% uh, percent of, of our budget on police and incarceration and the failed arrest and incarcerate model of public safety. Um, and so I, th I think that uh, it says a lot when last year there, was, there were still 194 people murdered in 2019, including 11 children. Um, and so uh, with violence being a public health issue, um, it is just as important as um, fighting the pandemic. And um, we need to make sure that cure violence is, uh, is funded, fully funded uh, for the duration of the program um, as it is an evidence-based program, unlike the things that we've been doing for years that don't work. Um, additionally, um, I, I appreciate that the board um, has, uh, has cut the budget for the workhouse in half. However, it needs to be completely defunded. Um, the population is down to around 100 people. Um, the conditions, as we've heard, are abhorrent. Um, and that money really needs to be reinvested in our community. Um, and real public safety, like cure violence in jobs, housing, healthcare. Um, you all know the problems that we have in the city. Um, and you know that that $8 million uh, can, can do a lot more for our people. Um, and the workhouse uh, needs to be closed. So I thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you very much for your comments. Our next speaker is Dr. Brittany Connors. And your topic is allocating uh, money and dignity towards uh, the goal of rehab and natural supportive environment. Yes, good morning, everybody. And thank you so, so much for this opportunity. Uh, it's been a really rough week. So I hope everybody's doing well or as well as they can. Uh, but this was really rejuvenating knowing that I, I have space to speak. Um, so yes, my topic is rehabilitation because I'm a doctor of occupational therapy, a local business owner, and a passionate rehabilitation uh, professional. Uh, hearing Ms. Jocelyn speak uh, makes me smile uh, because I can attest to uh, many working with many people like her um, whose stories have been the same of reports of injustices, of poor conditions, and over, overall dehumanizing experiences. Um, rehabilitation 
is one of the philosophies and goals of sentencing, but it is rarely enacted. It's under it's underappreciated, and we rarely have staff to enact things that can last and actually help people not only inside, but through the courts, outside, and through transitions. Um, people go through occupational deprivation, meaning everything that they know, everyone that they love is taken away. They don't get access um, to tools of everyday living. So coming out and learning how to pay your bills again or manage money or take care of kids, all of that becomes majorly disrupted. And there's almost no help on top of the stigma that you might face coming back to the community as someone who has gone through this horrific process and it can be traumatizing. And even as a person and a professional, it's, it's like having secondhand trauma. I will never know it. I hope I never know it, but I'm just thankful for the people who trusted me to walk with them. So my proposed solution, I am very much so um, supporting, closing, defunding, and allocating money to rehabilitation programs and professionals, uh, communities of faith, uh, programs like Cure Violence, because rehabilitation is what we need. There's nothing natural about jail. There's nothing re there's nothing refreshing or um, rehabilitative about the experience. And so that is where I stand and I am happy to be a part of the solution. But just like in healthcare, where our models are moving to the community, so does this. We cannot have people heal and we cannot help people adequately and, and, and in the ways that really recognize their humanity if they're okay. <laughs> We just cannot have that. Um, so I'm thankful for you. Thank you for allowing me to speak and I look forward to seeing the workhouse close. Thank you very much for your comments. Thank you for the work that you are doing on behalf of our community and you be blessed and safe. Uh, I'd also like to uh, make sure that all of our committee members have access to the list that is on our Google Docs so that you can keep track of what we're doing and also share with the public that um, we are already halfway through the list. Everybody's been so respectful of time so that the others can speak as well. And I'm positive that we're gonna get through the entire list. So let's uh, move forward with our next speaker. Um, did I hear a committee member? Okay, I'll move forward. Uh, Christine, uh, I'm going to try this. Dragnata? Dragonat. <laughs> Thank Dragonat. you. Okay, so your um, topic is uh, defending the workhouse. Uh, defunding the workhouse. Um, defunding, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Good morning. Um, my name is Christine Dragonat. <laughs> Excuse me. I'm a resident of the 13th Ward. My alder, Beth Murphy, serves on the committee. Um, I've emailed with her about this a little bit as well. Um, I appreciate the step to reduce funding for the city workhouse, but I think it can and should be defunded entirely. Um, in my email exchange with Alderwoman Murphy, she expressed her concern for public safety, which I hope and imagine the entire board of aldermen would say they share. Um, I share that concern as well. However, I don't believe that I do believe that we need to, to think differently about what makes our community safe and what doesn't. Um, I don't feel safer because people who can't afford bail are locked up. Um, I do believe that investing in community resources and services makes us all safer. I'm a social worker and I've been to the workhouse for community resource fairs in the past. Um, I've met a whole lot of people who are pre-trial and don't know when their court date will be and can't move forward with their lives. People locked up in the workhouse deserve to have those community resources on the front end rather than as an afterthought. With the workhouse population going down as part of a trend of decreasing jail populations over the past five years, why are we still pouring millions into locking people up pre-trial when I know how badly we could use the money currently spent on the workhouse for community needs like affordable housing, everything from emergency shelter to permanent housing? For example, if you've ever called or worked with someone to call the housing helpline for shelter and had to hear that there is simply none available, you'll know how awful that is and how badly we need to do better. Um, I also believe that fully funding cure violence for the, for the next three years has to be part of the solution. I've tuned into the, the Ways and Means Committee meetings over the past few weeks when I can um, to hear the conversation around the budget. Um, and given how tight it is, I believe that there's no better time than now to close the workhouse entirely and put that funding to better use where we really need it. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comments. Uh, I'd like to uh, move on to our next speaker. And uh, 
I'm I'm probably not going to even abuse your last name. So Ruth, <laughs> uh, your topic is shifting funds to programs and projects that support working class people. And uh, I'm I'm assuming that's me. Yes, come on, yeah, tell me okay, your last great. name. Okay, my name's Ruth Arisman. Uh, thank you very much for your, this opportunity to testify today. Um, I, I appreciate all the hard work that you've done. I know how difficult crafting a budget with limited resources and uh, such great needs is and appreciate your, your thoughtfulness and, and your consideration of our input today. Um, I'm here to testify today on behalf of Missouri Jobs with Justice, the St. Louis branch. I'm a co chair of the St. Louis Workers' Rights Board, and I'm a, a 40 plus year resident of the Ninth Ward and a social worker. Jobs with Justice is a coalition of working individuals, labor unions, community organizations, and faith congregations, and our core value is people over profits. We believe that we deserve an economy and a government that helps people flourish not the run on exploitation of the working class. That core belief has led us to support raising the minimum wage, supporting pro-democracy, electoral reforms, um, helping prevent the privatization of the, the city's utilities and assets and show up for workers organizing on the job. It also leads us to ask you to defund the workhouse. The workhouse is one of the clearest examples that economic and racial justice cannot be untangled from each other and treated separately. The workhouse jails people too poor to pay their cash bail bond. That uh, in itself is completely unacceptable. Even worse, it's primarily filled with black individuals, black working class people. 82% of the individuals who are incarcerated are black while they represent only 48% of the St. Louis city population. Incarcerating individuals while they wait for trial, uh, an average of 250 days, is an unwise use of limited city resources and harms the individual and family lives of those incarcerated. It often alienates people who are incarcerated from their families results in financial stress and insecurity. People often lose their jobs and they often have mental health and health needs that are exacerbated uh, because of lack of treatment. Closing the workhouse would immediately benefit those working people, by and large black working people and reinvesting the money into public health education and affordable housing would benefit their communities. Jobs, finally, Jobs with Justice is also concerned about um, the, the treatment of the workers, employees at the workhouse as it's defunded. We urge that they're given first higher privileges in other city jobs and the training to prepare them for those jobs and are a severance agreement negotiated with the union. We do acknowledge that some unionized workers may lose something in the short term but believe that closing the workhouse is a structural injustice that must be remedied. So finally, we urge you to do what's best for working families and defund the workhouse, reinvest the savings in pretrial services and other services that better support improving and strengthening the lives of vulnerable populations and communities. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you very much for your comments. Our next speaker is Julia Cushing, and your topic is defunding workhouse. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, I Obviously there's been a theme here today, so I won't repeat too much, um, but I just wanna point out that I as well am a city resident. Um, I work in the city, I work in violence prevention, um, and I work in almost every zip code in the city. So I see day in and day out proof that the safest neighborhoods in our city are not the ones with the most police, but are the ones with the most resources. Um, as many people have said, we are continuing to dump money into 
a model that does not work, that does not keep us safer. And for people of color and poor people, it actually actively makes them less safe. Um, we are hurting so bad as a city and a country right now for resources that prevent violence um, and resources that allow for people to heal, like mental health services, substance abuse treatment. And based on what everyone else has said this far today, I hope it's obvious that this is a popular opinion in this city. So if you aren't willing to close and defund the workhouse because it's the morally right thing to do, I hope that you will do it um, because it's what your constituents want. Thank you. Thank you so much for your comments. And our next speaker is uh, Wale, and I'm not gonna abuse your last name. And your topic is more obligations to treat uh, our constituents with humanity. Wale, are you with us? Wally, you're muted. Hello, can you hear me now? Yes. Ah, excellent. Thank you for this opportunity. Uh, my name is Dr. Wally Seward. I am a resident of the city in the sixth ward. My older is uh, Christine Ingracia. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to speak. And I wanna also say that I appreciate the difficulty of the decisions that, uh, that sit before you as public officials. Um, as a public ethicist who works with public officials on a daily basis, I know that no decision is easy. Uh, you are getting numbers thrown at you. You are getting moral uh, requirements thrown at you. People, you're were, were talking about uh, financial numbers, number of people incarcerated, and sometimes it's hard to know where to look. So I'd like to give a 10,000 foot view for a moment. Um, you have an opportunity here to be on the right side of history. Uh, the U.S. in the last four decades has, has undergone a massive experiment in being a prison state. We put more people in cages in this country than any other country in the entire world, including brutal dictatorships across the entire world. We, our community is... Maybe we lost your audio again. Your sound cut out, Wally. It seems his audio is cut out completely. It did. You can't hear you, Wally. I don't think he can hear us either. Yeah, everything went out. His his whole contact went out. Okay. Maybe could could the host mute him and unmute him? I can try here. Let's see. No, we still can't hear you. I can no, see you. No, we still can't. No. No. If okay, he tries to come back in, let's. This, we are. We're kind of ahead of schedule. Can we take a few seconds and try to plug him back in? Close your app and reconnect. Check, check, checking now. Yes, we can hear you now, thank you. Got you okay, back, so, okay. Fantastic, sorry about that. I will, I will try to keep it short. So I hope I've given you a sense of the historical precipice that you sit on. Uh, the entire country is moving toward decarceration. Uh, we need to stop breaking people and imprisoning them for their brokenness. Eight million dollars will go a very long way. And the last thing that I really want to impress upon you is in these times of financial hardship, 
We are not coming to you and asking you to spend more money on something. We are coming to you and asking you to spend less money on something that hasn't been working. Um, there is absolutely no reason if we have 110 people in the workhouse for the next year and we spend $8 million on it, that's $70,000 per person. There's so much better that could be done with that money. I appreciate your uh, taking the time to listen. Thank you so much, sir, for the comments and uh, sorry for the technical difficulty. But as we all know, this is our new world for a while. Um, yes, it is. Yes, thank you so much. Thank uh, you. Our next speaker is Janice Banks. And your topic is defending the workhouse. I'm, I'm sorry, defunding the workhouse. There's a Janice Banks and the attendees. Seems she didn't connect to panelists. I've uh, allowed her to talk, but I don't know if she has unmuted herself. Okay. I was trying to verify that that's the right person, but. So uh, Janice Banks, you're the next speaker, de defunding the workhouse. You need to unmute yourself. Nothing. Okay, so we'll go on to our next speaker. Our next speaker on the list is uh, Sarah Nixon. Defunding the workhouse is your topic. Hi, can you Hi. hear me all right? Yeah, perfect. Thanks. Um, thank you, Marlene Davis, for your thoughtful facilitation. Um, thank you, Jocelyn Garner, for your detailed first hand account of um, the workhouse's impact on yourself and your community and your family. Um, I do not know how to appeal to the moral authority of those who could still be against closing the workhouse in the midst of a pandemic and a national uprising. We are witness decarceration efforts across the country, including in San Francisco, where grassroots efforts succeeded in pushing the city's board of supervisors to mandate the closure of County Jail Number Four, and in Minneapolis, where activists got the Minneapolis Public School District to terminate its contract with the Minneapolis St. Paul Police Department. Closing the workhouse is not a question of when, but how. Just last night, a black protester was run over and killed by a FedEx driver. Failure by the board to close the workhouse will likely result in more protests, more uprising, and more social gathering that puts our lives at risk. The reasonable and moral course of action is to close the workhouse and support community-led public health initiatives like Cure Violence that are proven to support the city's most marginalized. We need public Wi-Fi, publicly subsidized cell phones and computers, housing for the housing insecure, free and accessible N95 masks, hand washing stations, hazard pay for all wage workers, expanded testing facilities and research, community land trusts, harm reduction for intravenous drug use, emergency mental health services, clean running water for everyone, funding for public defenders, and helpful prepared foods for all that need it. I cannot stress this enough. Last night, a black protester in St. Louis was run over by a FedEx driver. <laughs> I we can't do this. We, black people in St. Louis can't live like this. Mm. Thank you for your passionate comments. Uh, our next speaker is Inez Bordeaux and your topic is budget priorities. 
Hi, good morning. Um, I want to thank the committee for having this meeting today and giving us the opportunity um, to voice our concern around the current budgeting priorities um, for St. Louis City. Um, the very first thing that I want to say is um, there have been a lot of numbers said today when people are talking about the workhouse, about the actual number of people that are in the workhouse today. And I understand why there has been a bunch of different numbers presented. Um, because the population is dropping so fast, almost to the point to where we're having trouble keeping up with it. So as of today, Saturday, what is today, the 30th, there is 101, 101 people in the workhouse as of today. Um, I really just wanted to take a moment to talk about budget priorities. Like a lot of people have said, um, a budget is a moral document. Um, a budget is a value statement. When you put out a budget, you are showing us what your priorities are, what you care about. And based on this budget and continuing to fund the workhouse, it seems to be that the city government cares more about locking up people than actually taking care of people. I have spent time in the workhouse. I was there for 30 days. I have experienced the horrors firsthand. I know about the black mold and seeing it painted over, the toilets backing up, the showers that don't work, the, the rats and the roaches and the water that smells funny. Like I've experienced all of those things. And we are simply saying that the people of this city deserve better. The people of this city deserve better than what they have been getting. This is a resource poor city. We're not asking you to spend additional money on something else. We are asking you to take the money that is already there and invest in people and communities. I can tell you firsthand as someone who was in the workhouse for committing crime for a good reason, I was turned down for childcare benefits because I made $57 too much, which led me to overdraw my unemployment benefits in order to afford the $1,600 a month in childcare that I was having to pay after my ex-husband picked up a hot skillet off of a stove and burned me with it. Like, I know I am one of those people who ended up in the workhouse because of a lack of resources. And that is all we are asking you to do. I understand that it's a scary thing. I understand that it's something that hasn't been done in the city before, but we are asking this board to be brave, to be courageous and do what is best for the people of this city. Spending $16 million a year on a jail that only has 101 people in it is morally and ethically repugnant. Like we should not be doing that. For the upcoming budget year, we're talking about spending $8.8 .8 million on a jail with 101 people in it. By next week, that number will be below 100. It does not make sense to continue to keep the workhouse open when what the city needs is resources, what people need is resources, what our communities need are resources. So we are simply asking you to stop funding a jail with hellish conditions where people, the people that are being held there are there because they are poor, because they are black and they cannot afford their bail. They're not there because they're murderers or these extreme criminals. They are there for technical probation violations and they are there for crimes of poverty and things that can easily be addressed by the city if we just invest in people and communities and stop investing in this jail. We are asking you guys to be brave, be courageous and do the right thing by defunding the workhouse and investing that in the things that actually make us safe. Affordable housing, affordable childcare, mental health services, um, um, healthcare services, access to resources. That is what we are asking for. Because I can tell you this, it doesn't matter how many police you put on the streets. It doesn't matter how many jails you build. If people do not have what they need in order to survive, the crime is not gonna go down. The violence isn't gonna go down. We are gonna maintain the status quo. Right now, the, the city is experiencing a fever. The crime and the violence is the fever, but a fever is just a symptom. It's not the root cause. The root it's cause- 30 seconds. The root cause of, thank you, the root cause of the problem is the poverty. We have to fix the poverty. If we're not addressing the poverty, it doesn't matter how many police you put on the street. There will still be crime because people are fighting for their survival. 
So we are asking, we are begging, we are pleading with this board to do the right thing and defund the workhouse and invest that $8.8 million where it's needed most. And that's the people. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Our next speaker is Madison. And Madison, you can tell us your last name. Your topic is funding for community services. Hi, yes, my last name is Orozco. Um, thank you so much for letting me speak. Um, I just want to come today to talk about um, how we can really shift funding uh, in a way that's going to support the people in our community. So as you've all heard many times, in, we used to spend $16 million a year on the workhouse. Now we're cities proposing to spend about eight. That is movement in the right direction. However, it's still an unnecessary $8 million that can really be going to other places. $8 million that can be used to fully fund cure violence for however many years we need it. $8 million that can make sure that we always have enough money for affordable housing, that we can build shelters with, that we can do so much with in our community that can help with um, public health services right now, especially when we're in the midst of a global pandemic. It doesn't make sense for us to keep spending $8 million on a building that's holding 101 people, so less than 10% of the capacity of the original building. It just doesn't make sense for us to do that when our city is hurting, when our city is crying and we see it. We see people who need help and we see areas in which we can provide that help. We see organizations in the community who are on the ground, who are doing the work, who see the need. And what we know is that that $8 million has the power to transform the city, but instead we're locking it up and we're keeping it in an old, dirty, dilapidated building that we don't even have any use for. Okay, thank you so much, Melissa. I'm sorry, Madison. Uh, our next speaker is Nia Sumster, and your topic is inadequate. Uh, hmm. Okay. I lost part of my. Inad inadequate health care. Thank you, because I lost part of my stuff there real quick. Hello, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we have you. Thank you. Thank you. It's Naya Sumter. Um, and yes, I am a sickle cell warrior in AmeriCorps Vista with St. Louis University, a community health intern. And so while I do live in the county, I attend school and I use the hospital in the city. So the city's business really matters to me. Um, with this being said, it is disheartening to see that the city's priorities are more focused on police than public health. My grandmother always told me, if you want to know what's important to a person, check their financial statement. So that's exactly what I did. In St. Louis City allocates over 50, uh, about 50, 56 percent of its general fund towards public safety in about um, 0.3 percent of the bu budget to health and human services. Specifically, of this two, $277.7 million proposed for public safety, $8 million um, is being used to fund the St. Louis Medium Security Institution, colloquially, colloquially known as the Workhouse. <clears throat> This is a modern day debtor's prison. Among, among many other problems with this facility, there are massive health care injustices happening in, um, in here. The health care injustices happening in the facility are indicative of the disparities we see in the community. Earlier, I mentioned I use the hospital, um, and this is because I have a chronic illness called sickle cell. Unbeknownst to our community leaders, this disease has been an invisible problem in our Black community for centuries, particularly here in St. Louis. There, there's only one adult doctor who takes care of the entire Missouri population. Um, so if we wanna do what's right, we can start funding programs that really matter to the people, especially sickle cell awareness. So thank you for your time. Thank you very much for your comments uh, and much success for you and your endeavors in school. Uh, I'd like to now go back to one of our speakers that we missed. And uh, if you're with us, Reverend Dr. Dietrich, Detra Wise Baker, your topic is budget priorities. Uh, thank you, Ms. Uh, Marlene, and thank you for the spirit in which you're leading this meeting. Um, I'm an organizer with Metropolitan Congregations United, um, and we uh, partner with over 80 congregations in this region. 
And one of the campaigns that we lead is called the Break the Pipeline Campaign. And unfortunately, uh, the workhouse is a stop on the school to prison pipeline in the state of Missouri. And I just want to speak just for a second, my own story and experiences with the workhouse um, as a pastor and a chaplain and visiting there. Um, and I would just want to say on one occasion, I was visiting um, someone for a pastoral care visit and waited for over an hour to visit the person and just, you know, kindly asked what was going on. And I was uh, summarily uh, cussed out. Uh, and I just sensed the sense of the deterioration of the morale um, inside the facility. Um, I was in clergy gear, so it was clear um, who I was. Um, and it's not so much that I was clergy, but I could just tell that the people um, that were working in there, the human resources in that building were also being affected um, by the conditions um, in which they were working. And so I'm just here to encourage you, as everyone else has said, it's not good stewardship um, to keep this facility open anymore. And as a person of faith, um, the city has a moral obligation um, to be leaders um, in the morality of how you, how you distribute and use resources. So we implore you as people of faith um, to do the right thing. We know that's not always easy. Um, but the, the workhouse needs to close for so many reasons, and there's so many better things that it can be used for and have all been stated. God bless you all. Thank you so much, Reverend. Um, let's go to our next speaker, um, Jonathan Bloomberg. Your topic is shifting funds to support more holistic public safety measures that address the root causes of our uh, violence and harm in our community. Please move forward, Mr. Bloomberg. Um, thank you, Alderman Davis. Um, and thank you for having this open forum. I appreciate the opportunity to share my comments here. Um, here as both a resident of the city of St. Louis and as a representative of We Power. We're joining with our allies and our neighbors to express our strong support for defunding and closing the workhouse and for fully funding survivors. We strongly believe and know that black and brown lives matter and incarcerating people in the workhouse has been unsafe for years. During a worldwide pandemic, it is not just risky, but reckless and it is violent, putting people's lives at risk unnecessarily. Spending money on locking up black, brown and poor folks, while we don't have a good testing and tracing system set up in the city, we have insufficient PPE and mounting deaths is violent. This is the Ways and Means Committee. And there's a way right in front of us to move some of the most vulnerable people in the city out of harm's way. We owe it to them, each other and St. Louis to find the will to do so. Spending millions of dollars to incarcerate folks instead of spending that money on education or infrastructure, things that will yield long-term benefits is financially responsible. As, this, as an earlier speaker said, I don't feel safer because we choose to hold federal detainees or because we're holding people who can't pay bail or have technical violations in jail. As another speaker said, we know the areas with the most police aren't the safest, the places with the most resources are. We're asking you to support real public safety. We don't believe the workhouse makes us safer and we don't believe it's an effective or moral use of our taxpayer dollars. We can do better. We expect better from you, and we need better from you. What should we be investing in instead? The Close the Workhouse report lays out much better uses for this money. Sarah Nixon, an earlier speaker, laid out so many other things this money could go to. Food, water, job, housing, education. I'll lift up just two specific things. First, as other speakers have said, care violence is a necessary and preventative, not reactive, measure and a good investment in our collective safety it should be fully funded. Second, we should use this money to invest in our future, invest in our children and support equitable early childhood education instead of incarcerating our children's parents. Thank you for your time. We need your leadership. Thank you very much for your comments. Uh, I wanted to make sure that um, our, uh, our committee members are uh, attentive as I see based on the fact that we've not had much uh, interruption and I appreciate the fact that we are allowing the public to speak because it's not about us today it's about us listening 
and uh, getting additional input. Uh, so I'd like to go on to our next speaker, and that is uh, Kiana Cook. Your topic is defunding the workhouse. Hello, good afternoon, committee members. Um, my name is Kiana Cook, and I'm speaking on behalf of Empower Missouri. Empower Missouri is a statewide nonprofit oriented civic leadership, education, and research. Empower Missouri supports a wide range of social welfare issues from affordable housing and homelessness to criminal justice reform. Today, we are here to go on support of the funding work. Keeping the work right, city spends about $16 million to fund the workhouse yearly and is proposing to spend $8 million this year. That money, this money, um, invested in our communities for second, over half of its detainees are being held by the city on cash bail because they cannot afford to pay it. Holding people because they cannot afford bail is unfair and unjust. Finally, the population of the workhouse has decreased significantly, as many um, people have testified about. And when you take into account the federal detainees um, out of the equation, their space that the, in the CJC that inmates that are currently being housed. Thus, keeping the workhouse open is Empower Missouri Smart Tension emphasizes the sort of alternative towards policies that empower people to work their financial support. We join in this meeting and fund the workhouse and to work toward a system that is just fair and humane. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comments. Um... Our next speaker is Blake is a Strode, uh, and your topic is adding funding to affordable housing and homeless services. Uh, and, and violence prevention and other community services. Please move forward. Yes, good morning. Um, good morning. Uh, again, my name is Blake Strode. I am a resident of the 17th Ward here in the city, and I'm executive director of Arch City Defenders. Um, I also want to thank you, Alderwoman Davis, for your stewardship of this meeting this morning, um, and thank all the committee members for um, taking time to listen. And I see other members of the Board of Aldermen that are here this morning. I want to thank you all for taking time to listen as well. Um, We've, we've known in our work at Arch City Defenders long before this pandemic that we have a crisis in our communities that manifests in homelessness and housing, precarious housing um, and violence in our communities. And this pandemic has just exacerbated all of those things. And we're deeply concerned about the unhoused in this moment. We're deeply concerned about a lack of affordable housing as we see a wave of evictions on the horizon for low income tenants. And we're of course deeply concerned about the continuing um, community harm and violence that occurs. And for all of those reasons, we know that we desperately need money to invest in affordable housing. We desperately need money for effective violence prevention programs like Cure Violence as many people have spoken to this morning. And the closure and defunding of the workhouse is a great way to free up millions of dollars to fund all of those things and more. I just wanna speak briefly to a few points that um, I've heard spoken to over the course of Ways and Means committee meetings that I've listened to over the past week or so. Um, one which several have pointed out this morning is with respect to the numbers. We've heard a lot about the numbers. Um, again, 101 people in the jail this morning, $80,000 per detainee per year that is budgeted with, even with the $7.5 million cut that is budgeted for the next fiscal year. But I also wanna point out that we actually only have 541 total people on city and state charges in our jails, 541. And we have a jail called the City Justice Center with a capacity of 860 people. Now we've had much debate about how many people that jail can actually Hold. We've been told that 80% is the cap. That's 680. 
again, we have 541 people on state and city charges. So when we hear lines from the administration and from some public safety officials um, that have fallen back on saying, we don't control how many people are in the jails, we just control what happens once they get there. Well, that's not entirely true because in fact, the city is engaging in a contract with the federal government to house a certain number of federal detainees that it does not have to. It could end that contract and it could free up the space we need to close the workhouse immediately to move that money to other desperately needed things in the city of St. Louis. And there are public safety officials in this city who see that very clearly. We have two women running for circuit attorney in this city that agree on very, very little, but they both agree that the workhouse can and should be closed. I think that that speaks volumes. We have 30 seconds of the SLMPD, like Heather Taylor, who have said it should be closed. Vernon Betts has spoken to this contract. So I think there's more um, uh, diversity of thinking around public safety officials than is sometimes represented. And the very last thing I will say, which others have said, is we're in the midst of a national series of uprisings around taking of Black lives. This is a racial justice issue. You've heard people speak to that. We can't continue to say that Black lives matter and invest in institutions that harm those lives and don't actually lend support to our communities and people healthy and whole and, and with lives of opportunity. So I wanna thank you again for your time um, and, and urge you to, to take leadership on this issue. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, I'd like to go back to someone that we missed earlier. So Tony Taylor, if you're available now, uh, your topic was uh, funding cure violence. Are you available? Tony Taylor. It does not look like they're connected. Okay. Well, we'll, we'll continue with our list then and uh, move forward. Our next speaker is Joe Shepard. Your topic is diversity from police, from police and jails, invest in community resources and public health. Joe, it's Jay, Jay Shepard. Oh, I'm sorry, it's Jay? It's okay. Jay Shepard. And it's divesting from police and jails. Yeah, right my name is Jay. I live in the 20th Ward. Um, I just want to leave y'all with some questions to ponder. Why keep funding an empty jail? A jail that's barely, like there's barely anybody in there. There's 101 people in the workhouse right now. Why keep having taxpayers fund an almost empty jail? That a huge amount of taxpayers want to see closed because of all this wide community support, which y'all re see right now that we have as a campaign. Why keep funding an almost empty jail during a pandemic where people can't social distance in a jail and aren't given proper ways of sanitizing and ways to practice um, according to the CDC guidelines? Why keep funding an almost empty jail that incarcerates predominantly Black people during a time where Black folks nationwide are mourning and grieving and in pain and crying out to the police state to stop murdering us? Why give money to systems that support the caging and murder of Black people, like Tony McDay and George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and forever Mike Brown? Why not put that money into funding services that address the root causes of incarceration? Put that money into fully funding cure violence, fully funding the Affordable Housing Act. In a time where there's a $40 million budget deficit, we know exactly where you can get $8 million from closing the workhouse. I think that a lot of this speaks to y'all's ethics. I want y'all to think about the reason that you're in the positions that you are in. It calls into question your values and commitment to your constituents. And know that this is a decision that you all have to make that won't be forgotten. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much for your comments. Uh, I'm sorry that I um, mispronounced your name. Uh, our next speaker is um, Brooke, 
and I'll let you share your last name. Your topic is defunding the workhouse. Uh, yes, hi, uh, it's Maka Pagal. Okay. Um, sorry. Um, thank you for taking your time to um, listen to us today. Um, I'll keep it short and sweet because I think everyone else has said better and wiser um, what I wanna say. Um, I'm a resident of the eighth ward. I'm also speaking as a uh, home health nurse here in the city for the last three years. Um, also as a person of faith and a concerned citizen um, of my city. I definitely wanna echo Dr. Gold, Dr. Connors, Ms. Garner, um, Inez, Sarah, Nia, Jay. Um, they've all spoken clearly and well to what I wanna say. Um, but I think as someone who goes in any given day of work from Ladu to the city and witnesses disparities in wealth and access to healthcare, um, it is baffling to me to see even $8 million, which it's great that there's, um, that it's been cut in half, but even $8 million uh, allotted to a facility that is sitting at 10% capacity and that we have repeatedly um, seen evidence of its unsanitary and unhealthy conditions, both for the incarcerated people there and for the people that work there. Um, and as a nurse in a pandemic, um, to think that we would willingly keep open a facility that where people can't social distance, they don't have that option. And we're not talking, um, we're talking about largely um, unconvicted people, people that haven't had a chance to have a day in court and who knows when they will because our courts have, have been closed. Um, so they're being held longer um, and largely because they're poor and largely because they're black. And um, yeah, just as a constituent, I would like to voice, uh, yeah, that I support defunding this facility and I think there's been enough voices here today uh, for you guys to, to hear that support. So thank you for your time. I wanna thank you for your comments and also thank you for your service. Home health nurses are so critical, uh, most especially because we have so many people with so many disabilities and also living longer and wanting to be in their space. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker is Ryan Palmer. And your topic is defunding the workhouse. Everybody doing today? I'm a resident of the Fifth Ward, and also a, a true uh, St. Louis native. Um, and I just want to say that, you know, keeping the workhouse open really is not going to help us. I feel like, uh, you know, you can put it towards programs, you know, that really helps the community. I work with many of organizations. Uh, continue to do community work out here in the community. Um, I just think that we can we can see it, we can see the problem, and you know handle it in a whole nother way. Uh, we can see what's going on. We can see that it's more so an agitation on the reason why a lot of people getting locked up from the police officer. Maybe we can put funding towards giving the police officer mental health resources, and also making sure we do proper screening for officers. When we, uh, because I, I I ran into many officers and the encounter that I got with them was just ridiculous. Cause I was like, what's the attitude for? So, I mean, just, you know, closing the workhouse, it'll benefit us in a, in a long way as a city and as a region. And then to show the nation that we can truly reform our uh, policies uh, in the right way by working with the people and towards the people and for the people. All right, sir. Thank you so much for your comments. Uh, I also uh, wanted to make sure, I wanna try one more time uh, for Tony Taylor. Was Tony able to get through? Um, 
there are two phone-in callers and I don't know which one is her. I think I may have missed a message there for a second. Uh, I thought Senator Nashi was trying to call in too. Um, do you want me to allow I'll one? I'll give you a moment to, to see who they are. Yeah, I'll give you a moment to check on those, and I'll move on with the speakers. It looks like we have about five or six more speakers, so hopefully by then we can get everything taken care of. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Zoe Cross. Cross, and your topic is defending the workhouse, defunding the workhouse. Hi, yes. Um, uh, my name is Zoe Kraus. I'm a resident of the Sixth Ward. Um, I think, as uh, many other folks have said much more um, eloquently uh, than me, the, there is an overall um, need to adjust our spending priorities. And one of the ways that we can do that is to defend the workhouse and reallocate that funding towards um, public health and community initiatives like Cure Violence. So uh, I am just um, here today to give my support for um, completely defunding the workhouse while I think that the um, cut in the budget is a step in the right direction. I think this is a moment to make bold steps, not half steps. Um, and so this is the time to defund the workhouse completely and instead reallocate that money towards things that our community really needs um, and will need going forward as we deal with the repercussions of the pandemic. Um, and that's really all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you so very much for your comments. Uh, our next speaker is Amber Cole. You wanted to talk about salaries. Amber, are you still with us? I can't find her in the list either. Would you like to try one of these phone callers? Uh, not at this moment. I'm going to hold off till okay. I finish this list. All and right. then we'll try with the phone calls because I, I do want to be respectful. I think there's a state rep trying to get through too. I will recognize uh, state and uh, elected officials if they have to, uh, if they wanna have just a minute or so. But uh, other than that, we will not have outside speakers other than the ones who have signed up. Uh, so we didn't hear from uh, Amber. So let's move on to Sarah Westbrooks and your topic was budget priorities and workhouse. Hi, yes, can you hear me? You're perfect, thank you. Oh, wonderful. Um, I wanna say thank you, Ms. Davis, for this time. And um, I'll just start with saying to the committee, um, good morning and with gratitude for breath of life, I also have a heavy heart with the thoughts of the lives that have been lost to the injustice and for the people who are unreasonably and discriminatorily incarcerated. I, Sarah Westbrooks, will speak on behalf of Forward Through Ferguson in support of closing the workhouse, also referred to as MSI. And for this testimony, I will use the name of the institution as it's commonly referred to, which is the workhouse. So the issue that we have at hand is that we're at a crossroads of whether or not an institution should be funded or not. And this place has a record of keeping people, mainly people of color, locked up with high bail rates and leaving them caged in inhumane conditions for nonviolent offenses, leaving many exiting in a worse condition than when they entered. And at a time when people in our city are experiencing a pandemic crisis with high unemployment and continued lack of resources, the question of where equity lies in our systems echoes louder than ever for the underserved. And now more than ever, where we use funding is absolutely critical for the improvement of our community. We, Fourth through Ferguson, stand in support of defunding the workhouse, putting the welfare of individuals above systems embedded with racism, and therefore not creating a new workhouse space for the following reasons. We don't support funding an overcrowded, deplorable space within a system that criminalizes the poor. 
in the proposed $7.6 million of taxpayer funds can be better used to invest in the community in places such as affordable housing trust fund and early childhood education. We believe in justice for all, which happens to be a signature priority detailed in the Ferguson Commission report that should be implemented in place of funding the workhouse. And the following ways are what we would like to see the community better served. Eliminate incarceration for minor offenses. That way we're not incarcerate, incarcerating individuals for minor and nonviolent offenses. Second, establish alternative sentencing options. Establish effective alternatives to jail times, fines, and fees for violations of municipal ordinances. Third, treat nonviolent offenses as civil violations. And fourth, create community justice centers where you can increase interaction with the community and provide citizens with an opportunity to handle those offenses outside of the court. So I ask the Ways and Means Committee to think about what does it look like to have a justice for all? In our society, what would it look like to have justice for all? One thing it does not look like is depriving residents of the opportunity to thrive. We at Fourth through Ferguson asked the committee to not support the funding of the workhouse. Not funding the workhouse would stand as the right and necessary pivot to push us forward toward a St. Louis where we can invest in an opportunity to thrive. And that's all that I have. So I wanna thank you for your time. Thank you so much for your comments. Uh, I'd like to uh, check back with the technician quickly. Have you been able to recoup uh, Tony Taylor and a couple of others? Tony Taylor, Amber Cole and um... Janice Banks also, although it looks like she's connected twice, so I don't know which one is the correct uh, one to operate for. Oh, okay. okay, I'll give you a moment to clarify the, all of that uh, as we move forward. We're really doing good on time. So um, ready. I'm going to go along and move on with Gregory Laposa. Your topic is reinvesting uh, money into the community. Mr. Laposa, are you with us? Hello, can you hear me or no? Hello, I can, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay. All right, thank you. Good morning, uh, committee members. My name is uh, Greg Laposa. I'm a resident of the Seventh Ward. Uh, thank you for allowing me the opportunity to deliver comments today, and thank you for your leadership during this challenging time. I know it can't be easy to be in your shoes uh, reviewing our city's budget, especially when uh, resources are strained. Uh, as you're reviewing the budget, I, I would urge you to consider choosing to invest scarce resources uh, and dollars into what will give us the highest return and positive impact, which is fundamentally supporting the well-being of people who call St. Louis home. Like many others on this call, I would like to specifically ask that you make the decision to defund the workhouse and reallocate the money to services that promote economic opportunity and ensure a higher quality of life for residents. Many of the reasons why uh, we should defund the workhouse have already been stated on this call. So I'll just uh, recap a few and emphasize those. One, there's no valuable purpose to it. Um, two, the workhouse contributes to and represents our region's history of racial injustice, and it's directly tied to that. And three, it is an unsafe and degrading facility. The FY 2021 operating plan you are considering acknowledges that the good health of the city's citizenry is the core mission of city government, and that efforts to provide for the health and safety of city residents is paramount. The workhouse, for all of the reasons stated on this call already by the vast majority of people, proves to be an unnecessary obstacle to that mission. It's actually a clear threat to achieving that mission. The money that is currently allocated to the workhouse could and should be reinvested in what will actually make our community safer. Many on this call have already provided you with effective alternatives that promote health and safety, strengthening behavioral health services, expanding access to affordable housing, food distribution, anti-poverty measures. The solutions that actually support essential services like human services have been historically and consistently underfunded when it should be the top priority of government. At a time when there is an urgent need for food, jobs, and other services, it would be irresponsible to fund an institution that takes away from meeting those critical needs. Given that the workhouse contributes nothing to the health and safety of our community, and considering how much of a difference the proposed 8 million could make in improving the lives of people in our community, the workhouse 
is fundamentally a wasteful allocation of funds and resources. If there is significant stress on sustaining the, quote, multitude of institutions, unquote, as noted in the budget overview, please keep the institutions and services that actually contribute to the city's mission and eliminate unnecessary and wasteful institutions like the workhouse. Defunding the workhouse and reinvesting those resources into human and community services simply makes good economic sense, is morally just, and will ensure that the city, that St. Louis city government lives up to its stated mission. In closing committee members, you know the problems we face as a community today. You've undoubtedly heard from many of your constituents about the record levels of unemployment, the lack of access to basic services and the health disparities. Many in our city are, are watching the news and they're paying attention to this budget process, to the decisions you make now in the midst of this crisis. You have the authority to demonstrate leadership, to respond to this moment and promote a better community for all. Please make the right choice to free up critical resources by defunding the workhouse and institution that holds us, our city back. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir, for your comments. Our next speaker is Ken Haggerty, and your topic is uh, speaking in favor of social programs spending as public safety. Go right ahead. Good morning, Vice Chair Davis. Can you hear me all right and see me all right? Yes, sir. Very good. Well, thank you so much. Good morning, St. Louis and the Board of Aldermen Ways and Means Committee. And thank you, of course, for the opportunity to speak today. Uh, and I'd also like to extend a special thanks to Older Woman Rice for making me aware of today's meeting via Twitter. Uh, my name is Ken Michael Haggerty, and I am a resident of downtown St. Louis since the summer of 2017. And of course, I want to wish you and your loved ones uh, good health I'm grateful that you're holding today's committee meeting over Zoom, uh, and I'm hoping this is one tradition we can continue even after a need to uh, social distance lessons. I recognize that city budgets are complex, fraught, and political, so I won't pretend to have any kind of expertise yet, but I want to make take my moment today to express my sincere desire that you recognize the essential role of social programs and community investment in public safety. Uh, the proposed fiscal year 2021 public safety budget is, as I understand it, over $360 million. And as I understand it, almost entirely a policing budget, while other essential programs like health and human services and support for the unhoused are budgeted separately and at far lower allocations. I think it is important for us as a city to take a both and approach to public safety and to recognize that policing is a lagging solution to our fundamental challenges and quality of life issues. Investing in our community and in our people is investing in public safety. It even benefits our officers if our community is healthier, more stable, and more supported. My concern is that policing is a bandage on these fundamental problems our city face, and that if we continue to try and solve our public safety problems through policing, we will end up mummifying our city. I think there is so much opportunity in St. Louis, and we have the chance to do things right here, but we won't be able to do that if we don't have the budget. We need to spend our resources growing our city rather than reining it in. I have chosen to make St. Louis my home and over the coming years, I hope the Board of Aldermen will continue to provide its leadership and I am definitely eager to do what I can to contribute to my new home. And of course, to echo so many of the others on this call, I definitely support cure violence. Uh, really would love to see a lot of more investment in lead abatement uh, initiatives since that is, uh, seems to be a large uh, contribute, contribute, contributor to, uh, to certain uh, violent crime, public health investments, public transit investments, education. Uh, and again, I'm really eager to see where this city goes. So thank you again for the opportunity to talk today. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, that, uh, now we need to go back to two people that had signed up on the list uh, before, uh, it was cut off to start the meeting. So I know that we're trying to get Tony Taylor on and Don is trying to get on. Uh, I heard nothing. And also, uh, I believe it's, it's Don, uh, D-A-W-N is trying to get on who we missed. But um, I see one other person that is trying to speak. Molly uh, was not on our list, but we will, go with the first two people that were signed up and then we'll pull Molly in uh, after that, okay? So let's go with Tony Taylor. Can anybody hear me? 
Uh, good afternoon. Can you hear me? We can hear you fine, Tony. Let's, uh, okay, tell us thank your topic. you. Um, uh, I wanted to just uh, weigh in on the Dang. kill violence. I'm part of the steering committee. Uh, I'm the community advisor on the steering committee for kill violence. And I want, I live in Ward 25, and that's a high burglary area. And the reason that I feel that is is because majority of the high schools and elementary schools are closed in that area. And I feel like that if we would use some of the budget money to like turn that into affordable houses or more recreational centers or some type of trauma support centers, because with all the violence that's occurring in our community, the, the youth is going to need some type of organizations to help them with the trauma. It's, and also, I wanted to say that it needs to be more funding going into Kim Gardner's office for police brutality shootings. With the uprising that's going on right now, I feel that St. Louis can make a political strong stand with backing the um, Kim Gardner office with her FIU uh, division. With um, that's considered public safety, safety to me as well. The police shootings. Also, I know quite a few people that was affected by community violence this past weekend. I also knew those children that was shot two years ago, the three-year-old little girl. I helped raise her parents. And all of those people are still traumatized in our community. And I just feel like if you put more effort in helping the people mentally, they will get stronger physically and be able to prosper and we will cut down on some of this crime. I also strongly feel like you should keep the money, the budget into cure violence due to all of that plays a part with cure violence from community shootings, from police brutality shootings, from the crime rate. We just had a seven year old little boy and a 12 year old little boy to be shot due to breaking into someone's home. The burglary rate is going to increase again all around the city if we don't hurry up and do something about the lack of education we have in our communities, the low paying jobs. If you give these youths a livable wage job or just that job training, they will be interested in it. You got to put something out there in the community that makes the people be like, oh, I want to grasp onto that. Because what I do know about the community, things that they don't know about, they don't care about. And that's the honest to God truth. And I also believe that, yes, we do need to close the workhouse. That's very necessary because I know people that work there and they talk about the conditions that they have to be subject to. And if they are the workers and they're being subject to it, I can only imagine what's happening to the prisoners. So I just wanted to weigh in today on all of that. And that to me, everything that I spoke about was public safety. So it all ties in together if you would take the budget and put it in the right way. Thank you very much, and I'm so sorry for the technical difficulty, but we're glad that we heard your comments. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, now we're ready, I believe, is, is it Molly Schwartz? Okay. Well, all of a sudden, I don't hear nothing. Oh. We can hear you. Okay, uh, thank you. My name is Molly Metzger. Oh, I Metzger, the, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, I live in the sixth ward. Thank you for listening this morning. Please defund the workhouse. Every St. Louisan is harmed by the continued existence of the workhouse. Of course, of course, in very different ways, but everyone is harmed, including white people like me who have never been inside the workhouse. When we dehumanize other people, when we passively allow dehumanization to happen, we dehumanize ourselves. I believe that if we can realize this, we can bring ourselves and our city closer to healing. When we dehumanize other people, we dehumanize ourselves. Please continue to listen. Please defund the workhouse. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comments. Um, that ends our list of those who have signed up to speak Madam, today. Madam, Ms. Madam Chair. Yes? Mm -hmm. This is uh, Alderman Muhammad. You are missing one of my constituents. She was number 39 on the list, uh, oh, Amber Cole. She's on the call. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, hold on. Good morning. Good, Good. afternoon. 
Okay, afternoon. great. This is a good afternoon to the committee, to my alderman, uh, Alderman Muhammad. I'm a citizen of the 21st Ward, also a voting citizen. Um, I'm a neighborhood captain. I believe in rehabilitation. I'm also a HMCA a volunteer, which is the Homicide Ministers Community Alliance. I'm trained and informed in trauma, as well as a recovering uh, part of the Missouri Coalition of Recovery Support. And some of the words that I heard, I said, I might be the, be the uh, thorn in somebody's side, but, you know, I don't agree with everyone, but I believe we can come to terms on different things. When I hear the word, everyone is harmed, that is not true, because I don't feel that I have been harmed because of the workhouse. However, I have been harmed by not being uh but it, uh, allowing um, officers to be funded, uh, not having a uh, representation as far as uh, being involved with the community development. And so far, we, we get a lot of income with community development, but Northside does not get developed. Um, I hate to let somebody know, but no jail or no prison is safe. Every jail and every prison is, has some kind of uh, form of uh, violence. Also, I've been a part, I'm, I'm totally with um, law enforcement. I've been in law enforcement over 30 years, worked in prison. And I was not part of the problem. I have seen just like it's bad African uh, uh, people with bad uh, behavior in the African-American community, in the uh, white community, as well as the police force. It's always a bad apple in someone. Uh, I'm looking at the different uh, uh, level of uh, personnel. I'm looking at the mayor's department. I'm looking uh, at the building and also the uh, president of the aldermen. I'm looking at a layer of people, certain people. You got three or four people look like they're watching the same pot of money. You have an assistant to the assistant to the assistant, you know, so that should be cut. Uh, I'm also asking for mental health and substance use financing. I'm totally, I'm not agreeing with cure violence because I have not seen where it has in the places that has been, uh, that it has taken place. I have not seen a dramatic drop in that city. The behavior is unless you can stop throwing money at, at, at programs and not change the behavior. You can put money in the parks. I believe my argument has put money in that park and I'm scared for it to be opened up because it's gonna return back to where it is unless you make someone accountable for their actions. No, not everyone no, not everyone needs to be in the workhouse or in the justices, but it is somebody that needs to be in there. And also the people that are housed in the workhouse right now, only a hundred is because they're being separated so that coronavirus will not spread. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comments. Uh, as we move forward uh, to closing our meeting, there are a couple of uh, agenda items here that we must address. Madam Vice Chair. Yes, sir. There was an, an additional person, Gary Newcomb and Gary. Jamala Rogers. Mm -hmm. They were on okay. the updated list that was uploaded on the drive. I'll send you time to see Thanks, was skipped. All right, we'll take those two and then we'll have to end. Okay. Janice. Gary Newcomb. Gary Newcomer, Newcomb. pardon me. Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll on. take Gary Newcomb and then, and then Newcomb. we'll take the next person. Go right ahead, yeah. please. Janice Banks was also skipped. I thought Denise. I heard Janice. No, she she was connected in the attendees list 
and oh. I did add her after I found her. Okay, yeah, I still have a check mark that she was skipped. Right. Okay, all right. Uh, so we have two people after this gentleman. Please uh, share with us your topic. Hi, thank you for having me on this online forum today. I really appreciate all the effort that went into making sure that this could happen virtually. I also wanted to thank Terry Kennedy for going way out of his way to make sure that I had the link and opportunity to speak today. So thank you for that as well. Um, I'm here and I'll try to keep this as brief as possible. I'm here to support uh, retaining funding for the Affordable Housing Trust Fund at 6.1 million uh, for next year. And if possible, finding new ways to increase funding. My name is Gary Newcomer and I currently serve as the Director of Operations for the Community Builders Network of Metro St. Louis or CBN. I'm also a resident of the 26th Ward and a lifelong city resident as well. Uh, the Affordable Housing Trust Fund is a local funding tool that helps keep people safe and healthy in their homes. It funds services like rapid rehousing, eviction prevention, affordable housing construction, rent, mortgage, utility assistance, supports for the unhoused, and the list goes on and on uh, of tools that have helped keep countless families safe in their homes. Uh, for a number of years, but especially during the height of the COVID-19 pandemic this spring. Earlier in the budget process, there were a lot of uh, cuts proposed to the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. Even after a single day, we heard from dozens of organizations who were very opposed to these cuts and fearing a situation uh, where there might be a future outbreak where these services would be gone. Um, the overwhelming thing that we heard from our partners is that housing is healthcare, and that's something that we believe strongly in too. Uh, so in April, after a lot of support at the Board of ENA meeting, um, Mayor Cruz and President Reed and Comptroller Green made the difficult decision to prevent these cuts and fund the Affordable Housing Trust Fund at $6.1 million. Um, CBN, the Community Builders Network, strongly supports this decision uh, and hopes that you all might even be, find, might be able to find ways to prevent future cuts or even ways to increase funding for the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. So. I'll stop there and you have my written comments as well uh, via email. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Can we move on to uh, the, the last person to speak? That would be Jamala Rogers. Banks. Oh, the other person, yeah. Mm -hmm. Janice Banks that was on the list. Janice yes. Banks. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh-huh. She on? Ms. Banks, are you available now? Ms. Banks, we're ready for you to speak. Did you unmute yourself? Your topic is defunding the workhouse. She is unmuted. We just couldn't hear her. She might need to move closer to the microphone. Okay. Ms. Banks, could you move closer to your microphone and speak up? Does it indicate that she's open? It looks like she's moving to a different spot to try and get better service. She's on okay. the video. We can see her on the screen. Okay. Maybe we should come back to Ms. Banks. Let's move forward with Jamal Rogers, please. Ms. Rogers, are you available now? Mm -hmm. Seems that people that I've brought in from the other, from the attendees list have microphone issues. Okay. okay. 
well, I don't have any control over making this possible for them. It's technology and there's nothing we can do about it. it uh, well, can... if, sorry, if, if you give me a minute, I'm gonna send them back to the attendees list and unmute them from there. Maybe that will work. I appreciate your attentiveness, thank you. Let's go. Okay. okay, Jamala Rogers, can you unmute your microphone? I did. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear yeah. you. Yeah. Okay. Good. Okay. Now I got to start all over again with all that good stuff. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> we want to hear it. Yes. We want to hear. So good, good morning, and thank you for uh, giving all of us the opportunity to talk. And I was saying the good thing about going last is that all my colleagues have so eloquently spoke to some of the same issues that I would have addressed. Uh, I just want to say that most of the folks that are talking about the workhouse issue uh, weren't even born when that place was constructed. And I do have to say that since day one, it's been problematic and we've been fighting to shut it down. There were lawsuits early on. Uh, my partner, Percy Green, landed in there many times for civil disobedience and also uh, advocated for a shutdown. So my point about that is here we are a couple of generations later and we still have not learned our lesson, which seems to be a problem for St. Louis, that we don't learn our lessons. We just keep repeating the same thing over and over again. One of the things in addition to us needing to fund human services and social services, particularly uh, now that we see the contradictions and inequities that COVID has exposed, I really want us to look at a more holistic budget beyond this budget, because I think we should know that the issues and circumstances are going to be greater uh, in 2021 and beyond based on COVID including uh, mental health issues, including economic issues. I would really like to see a more visionary approach taken to the budget in addition to dealing with the human services piece of it and the moral component of it is that we have not taken that budget and looked at what needs to go, what needs to stay, what needs to be increased. That's, that's where I think you all are right now is just looking at that budget in a a, a deeper way, a fuller way. And I'm just glad to see that there's some uh, visionaries on this panel because some of you are also on public safety committee. And so you understand and help to shepherd in programs like uh, Cure Violence. So I, I think you got community support, you got community involvement, you got a community engagement that want to see something different in the city. And I really would like to, us to move forward and act like we're in the 21st century instead of the 19th century. Thank you. Thank you so much for your comments. Uh, and most especially thank you for all the hard work you've been doing for so many years on behalf of others. Uh, as we move forward, I know that we're still trying to work on Getting Ms. Banks online. Uh, are you there yet, Ms. Banks? If we cannot be successful, I would appreciate it that we get her written comments because I think she also has written comments. Uh, so they'll be in our public record. Uh, also, um, there are a couple of things that we need to do here on the agenda. First, I wanted to thank the public for their testimony and make sure that we know and realize that as we move forward, we will have to work closer uh, in order to help solve all of the crises we have. COVID is just one of them, but we have a number of them. I'd like to acknowledge uh, uh, all of our written co comments that will be coming in to us because that took extra time for you to do that. And we do appreciate that. Uh, all of our attendees, most especially our committee members who took the time on this Saturday to be a part of this public hearing. I also wanna take a moment 
and go down the list of uh, seniority for our committee members for Ways and Means to give you a moment because I know you probably have a brief comment for us to close out with. Uh, and if you don't, if you have an announcement of an activity or something that you'd like to announce, take that time to do that before we adjourn. Let's start off with our um, first uh, would be Alderman Vollmer, who is not with us, but he is being excused today. Uh, also, um, let's move on. I think the first person here is uh, Alderman Vaccaro. Come, Where are we? Is the alderman still with us? Okay, I don't hear Alderman Vaccaro. Alderwoman Hubbard. Uh, thank you, um, Madam Vice Chair and members of the committee and all of uh, us <sighs> on the line. I, I know this wasn't an easy thing for us to do on a Saturday morning, but I appreciate you all for um, giving your testimony. I, I know a lot of conversation was talked about regarding $8 million, uh, but we are dealing with over a billion dollar budget. And this uh, time is one that is going to be very difficult for us as a city um, to move forward. So we, as a committee, we do have, have a lot of um, serious conversations that have to be had regarding our budget. But um, I thank you all for all the testimony. Uh, we have a, a lot going on. We are concerned about the conditions at the workhouse. The city has made great strides in addressing all of the things that you all have said in many of those hearings. And we just got an update last week on what that progress is and was. And I know some of those conditions may have been like that for some people at the time that they were there, but things have changed uh, tremendously. And I I don't, I, I said I wasn't gonna touch on this, but I, I heard some veiled commentary uh, regarding uh, the workhouse and regarding the current situation that's going on in our community regarding the protest. And I would just encourage everyone uh, to know that that's not something that we take lightly. Um, as a community, we, we work hard, we work our butts off trying to do what's in the best interest of people who look like me. So I just hope that you all would um, let us do what we were elected to do. We hear your, you loud and clear like we said the numbers are down at over um, less, almost at 100 people because we have utilized social distancing in those facilities. We have went above and beyond to make sure that we are doing the right thing in regard to housing offenders during a time like this. And we have heard you and we have released a lot of people, some who have came back multiple times since we've done that. So I would just um, like to let you all know that we hear you, you know, um, with me, I, I don't necessarily uh, care for the bully tax tactics that are used sometimes in regards to me and my leadership, and it will be met with resistance, but I thank you all for your commentary. We are listening, and we are doing the very best that we can to address all of those concerns that you all have made, and that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Alderwoman uh, Hubbard. Uh, next, we have uh, Alderwoman Howard. Yes, I'd just like to echo, echo uh, Alderwoman Hubbard's comments, and I appreciate those people that tuned in today and shared their comments. We have a portion of our constituency, um, and I think we need to listen to everyone, and I appreciate their organization mm -hmm. and, and their ability to approach us as a group, and each, each uh, comment is valuable, and we do hear you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Alderwoman Murphy. Uh, yes, I would just reiterate what uh, Alderwoman Hubbard said. Appreciate everyone who spoke and the violent crime. So I said that's what I hear most from my constituents, not the nonviolent ones uh, being you know put in the MSI 
or anything, but it's the violent criminals that my constituents seem to be most concerned about. And that's all. Thank everyone for speaking. Thank you very much. Uh, Alderman Oldenburg. Thank you, older woman. Uh, I, I will just recover some of the ground uh, because it is important, I think, to, to restate um, that it's appreciative of this committee to receive all the comments that we yep. received today. Um, we need to be held accountable as elected officials uh, by voters and by taxpayers. And, and um, there's a statement that decisions are made by those who show up and you all showed up today and, and made your comments, very important comments uh, to this committee. And we will do our best to reflect uh, those discussions, those comments, those concerns um, in our very tough task of finalizing this budget. So I just wanna thank everybody, everybody who spoke today, I appreciate that. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. Thank you, Alderwoman Spencer. Alderwoman Spencer. Alderman Muhammad. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Vice Chair, and thank you for leading such a such an informed and uh, well delegated committee hearing for public input. Uh, I do want to say this: I, I, I keep hearing people say that. 60% or 70% of our city's budget goes to public safety. And I hope that uh, our residents actually understand that the, the Department of Public Safety is not the police department. Uh, it is a department of several different divisions and major bureaus in our city, from building division to the excise division, to the police department, to the fire department. So when people say 70% or 6% of our and you operate in budget goes to public safety uh, or it goes to police, that's a misconception, that's not true. Um, or that it goes to the workouts or our city correction divisions, it's not true. Uh, and I wanna commend uh, Commissioner Dale Glass, who is our Commissioner of Corrections. Uh, since he has been a commissioner, the population in the workhouse has steadily decreased. When he first arrived uh, uh, as our commissioner, we had 350 people uh, in the workhouse and now we have under 150. Uh, and he has made great improvements. Uh, and I want the food. I heard someone say that the food is, is it, 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 someone said the food was pretty much garbage. That's not true. Yeah, uh, it's good there now. Yeah. It's not true. The inmates actually cook their own food. They have a baking program and they have a top of the line chef program as well. And, 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 some, and some of those inmates and people that's currently there, I will put them in any restaurant and they will do a fantastic job. And that's because of the training and the workforce that they are receiving from, uh, uh, from uh, the, the Division of Corrections. Um, I just wanna make sure that that's clear. Uh, again, I just wanna commend Commissioner Glass and I thank everyone for giving their public comment today. Uh, it was vital uh, and it is necessary. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Thank you very much. Alderwoman Boyd. Alderwoman Boyd, are you still with us? Did you unmute yourself, Alderwoman Boyd? Can you hear me? Now I can, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, I appreciate everybody that came to the table today. She's got an echo. See, now it's acting crazy. I didn't understand her. She echoed a lot. She's, uh, she's, clear, she's clearing it up. Right. Okay, you want us to go on, all right. Yeah. Okay, Alderwoman uh, Clark Hubbard. Okay, thank you, Madam Vice Chair. I see that Alderman Vaccaro is back on the call. Did you want me to yield? Uh, no, ma'am, go right ahead. 
Okay, well, I just want to thank everyone who took the time out on a Saturday morning, like my colleague said, to come speak to us. I know that accountability and accessibility is important to all of us. And I echo a lot of the comments that a lot of the speakers had, a lot of the feelings, and I appreciate and respect the positions of passion that a lot of you all spoke from. Um, what stood out to me was uh, that this is a moral document, and we all understand that, and also a value statement, and we all work hard for that. And that based on COVID, like Sister Jamala Rogers said, this is gonna open up even broader and wider gaps on issues that we've already been dealing with. So thank you all again for coming on. We were doing, we were here to do just what Madam Vice Chair said, that was listen and respect and take away. So thank you and I hope you all enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much. I wanna go back to uh, Alderman Vaccaro. Yeah, I really didn't have any comments. I I just couldn't un get myself unmuted quick enough before, okay. but just so everybody knows I'm out here. I, I was not sleeping. So yeah, I have no comment. Um, I do All echo right. what, what my my colleague and friend, uh, Alderman Muhammad says, so uh, that I've been through there and the food is, is actually decent. But anyway, I'm just listening. So. All right, sir, thank you. I wanna go back and see if Alderwoman Spencer is still there. Okay, I don't hear from Alderwoman Spencer. She's not online. Okay, so what I'd like to do now is to, again, say thank you to everyone, to our technicians, to our Board of Alderman Clerk, to all of those uh, department heads that I see are listening and being attentive and most especially to Paul Payne. You've heard all of the concerns. And uh, again, everyone have a blessed and safe uh, day and weekend and future. But as we move forward with this budget this year, it is gonna be extremely difficult, but we're all gonna to work together and to do the best we can for the future. Uh, we'd like to now adjourn our meeting and uh, look forward to talking with all of you all on Tuesday to start the work. Meeting is adjourned.